It is the most powerful machine ever built by man. The International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, ITER, has reached yet another milestone on November 7, 2019. The concrete base which will house the reactor has been finished, next step is to get the roof going and eventually the reactor itself. This is good news for all participating countries in this monumental task, paving the way for a future with clean and unlimited energy. The roadmap remains unchanged with its first test runs happening at around 2025. But ITER is only an experiment that will be used to prove five main concepts produce 500 megawatts of fusion power, demonstrate the integrated operation of technologies for a fusion power plant, achieve a deuterium tritium plasma in which the reaction is sustained through internal heating, test tritium breeding, and demonstrate the safety characteristics of a fusion device. Why is fusion taking such a long time? Well, recently the ITER project has reached a milestone where the last concrete base foundation has been finished. A massive building structure that spans 73 meters high and 120 meters wide to house the largest fusion reactor ever created. Next is the assembly of the reactor itself, which is set to start in 2020. The project should have its first run in 2025, and it's on its way to achieve that. Nevertheless, it has been a bumpy road, and costs for the project are only increasing. Either costs were initially estimated to be around 22 billion euros until completion, but new estimates are around 45 to 65 billion added to that when the next and final phase begins in 2025. So the final estimations are all above 80 billion euros, way more than what was predicted back in 2001, when they thought that they could build this machine for only 5 billion euros. But that is only one of the problems Fusion has faced since they started research more than 60 years ago. As we will see here, some of the problems may be solved by either in the near future, but a lot of research still needs to be done. Regardless, the question still remains. Will it be able to finally make Fusion work and solve all of our energy problems? While we wait for the answer, let us dive into why fusion is so difficult to achieve and some of the current problems and potential solutions. But first, what is fusion? Fusion is the most powerful reaction after fission. With fission, you gain energy by splitting atoms apart, usually done with large unstable nucleons such as uranium or plutonium in its fissile isotope form. With fusion, you have two lighter elements fusing together to form a heavier element. The most common example is using deuterium and tritium fusing together yielding helium, a neutron and energy. The most potent reaction can yield eight times more energy than fission, but to get to that you need to use a lot of energy in the first place, which is the opposite of fission. For instance, Fission of heavier elements requires in between 7 to 8 million electron volts to overcome the nuclear force that holds the element together, and the energy output is about 200 million electron volts. The beauty of the system is that once fission starts, it is self-sustained, and there is little to no need for external energy input to keep things going. Fusion, on the other hand, requires an enormous amount of energy to initiate the reaction. All of this to overcome the electromagnetic force of positively charged particles called the Coulomb barrier. The idea is to get the atoms close enough so the strong force overcomes the electromagnetic force and the atoms fuse together. We can visualize this with a game of pool, except that you are not trying to pocket the balls. Instead, you are only trying to hit them dead on with a minimum amount of energy, which is a lot of energy by the way, so they fuse together. Now, you also have to take into account that with atoms you have magnetic forces acting against the hit, making precision particularly more important. And then we also have the distance which adds another level of difficulty. So imagine that you have a huge table and all you want to do is hit another ball that's centered to make them stick together. 
One way to make this easier would be to increase the number of balls available on the table and provide the speed necessary to the balls so the hit happens and they fuse together. What a tokamak does is exactly that. It uses extreme magnetic fields to put the atoms as close as it can together while heating everything to millions of degrees Celsius and speeding up the atoms. On Earth, the best temperature for this to happen is about 150 million degrees Celsius or 10 times higher than that of the center of the Sun. Using deuterium and tritium as an example, when they fuse, what you get is an unstable isotope of helium quickly becoming stable by releasing one neutron and 17.6 million electron volts. The comparison in between fission and fusion energy output is done in terms of total energy released per nucleon. Taking into account uranium-238 as an example, you get 200 million electron volts divided by 238 nucleons yielding 0.84 million electron volts while fusion you get 17.6 divided by 5, which is equal to 3.52 million electron volts, or about 4 times more energy per nucleon. Single proton fusion reaction yields twice as much energy, but it's very difficult to achieve, whereas deuterium and tritium are the preferred elements to be used. By now, you know that this is what keeps stars alive for billions of years. At every second, the sun transforms 600 million tons of hydrogen into helium at a temperature of 15 million degrees Celsius. As you might have guessed, this is no easy task, and pretty much all problems with fusion starts here. First, the problem is not with fusion. The problem is the amount of energy needed to jumpstart the reaction and sustain it with its own energy output, what they call the break-even energy production. Most projects fail at that point, where they cannot sustain the reaction for too long and the amount of energy input is significantly higher than the output. As of the making of this video, the Joint European Toros, or JET, it still holds the world record for input-output energy ratio with a 16 megawatt output and a 24 megawatt input of heating and a total of 700 to 800 megawatt input of electrical power. This is still far from optimal. The problem is that we only know how to achieve fusion by using raw methods, which can be divided into two categories, electromagnetic confinement or inertial confinement. Both are being researched, but the one that seems to be winning is the first one. Just like the Large Hadron Collider, scientists believe that building a bigger structure with a strong magnet would be the way to achieve fusion. But bigger reactor means higher costs and an unprecedented need for precision of materials. Even the concrete base that has been recently finished needed an absurd amount of specific mixes to achieve certain needs. But the biggest problem is the electromagnetic system. Like I mentioned before, 150 million degrees is no joke and keeping all of this contained at high pressure, you need a really strong EM. Up till now, this is still not possible. And just to give you an idea of how difficult this is, the wiring necessary is around 100,000 kilometers long, which can be wrapped around Earth 2.5 times. It was produced by nine different suppliers, which took eight years of manufacturing from 2008 to 2015. If any accidents happen, we are looking at years of waiting time to get anything fixed. And that is only the beginning. The central solenoid has to resist a huge amount of current, or 15 mega amps. It has to support forces ranging in the 60 mega newtons, which is equivalent to 6,000 tons of force. The NASA Space Shuttle thrust reaches only 30 mega newtons. The maximum field reached in the center of the solenoid is 13 Tesla. That is equivalent to 280,000 times the magnetic field of Earth. Adding to that, while the inside of the tokamak is at 150 million degrees, the outer part where the reactor is located, called the cryostat, keeps everything cooled down to extremely low temperatures or less than 10 Kelvin. With all of the things I described here, it is easy to picture why it is taking such a long time to get fusion working. Every single detail cannot be overlooked or else everything is delayed yet again. 
but most likely there are a multitude of problems that will be solved with ITER. But like I said here, the electromagnets are the most crucial part of the development and everything available is still experimental. No scientist knows for sure if it will be able to work. However, there are some really good new EM technologies in the horizon that will significantly decrease power consumption and cost, while being more powerful than anything created at this point. That is what I will talk about next. For the most part, finding EM coils that can reach the levels required by fusion reactors was always the main problem scientists were trying to solve. The fairly recent discovery of non-conventional superconductors opened the doors to new materials that can be used for fusion in a not-so-distant future, which is the case with MIT. In 2018, MIT received an investment of $30 million to build the world's strongest electromagnet using a new superconductive material called yttrium barium copper oxide, YBCO for short. This will be at least four times stronger than any electromagnet used currently. The reason they are going with this is because the material belongs to a family of crystalline chemical compounds that are famous for displaying high temperature superconductivity at temperatures above the boiling point of liquid nitrogen at 92 Kelvin, or 15 degrees above that. This alone will decrease the overall cost of building a tokamak. The plan is to use the super electromagnet in a prototype fusion reactor called Spark, and once again, we fall into the research and development loophole. Either coils are made of niobium tin or niobium titanium, which become superconducting at supercritical conditions using helium at 4 Kelvin. Using this material will make possible to carry higher currents and produce stronger magnetic fields than conventional counterparts while consuming less power and being cheaper to operate. YBCO takes this a step further since temperatures needed are much higher translating into lower energy input for a magnet that is four times stronger than niobium tin. But there are some caveats to this technology, hence why it needs a lot of research. And one of them is that since YBCO is a crystal, that means it is brittle, which makes transforming this material into a wire by any conventional means nearly impossible. But not all is bad news. The most promising method that they will explore here is a form of YCBO deposition onto wires similar to CVD technology in a technique called coated conductor. This will allow for a crystal as brittle as YBCO to take the shape of the coil and help its superconductivity. But then again, this requires extensive experimentation, adding a few more decades to this endeavor. All we can do now is wait for it to fire up its reactor, which is only 35 years away. So I guess the 30 year cycle will just keep on going. Alright folks, that's it, we're done here.